Hello, everyone. Welcome to another thought leadership session powered by Voice of Healthcare. My name is Kostip Chatterjee. I'm working as a principal with Frost and Sullivan's Global Healthcare and Life Sciences team. And today I have with me an esteemed guest from one of the leading hospitals in India, is Deepak Venugopalan. Uh, he has over 23 years of experience in healthcare business management, the last eight years of which has been in senior management and leadership roles. Directly, he has worked with proprietors and board of directors. He has gained a substantial experience across all functions, functional areas of management, including enterprise-wide P&L management, uh, green and brownfield initiatives, and public-private partnerships um, between leading private hospitals and large and government agencies. He has worked across different healthcare markets of the country. In fact, he has traveled all over India. He has experience working in Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Maharashtra, Goa, Gujarat, NCR, Kolkata. So east, west, north, south, he has been everywhere. So he's basically at the center of everything happening in the private side of healthcare today. Right now, he's working as a chief operating officer regionally for Manipal Hospitals. And he is um, a man a large team uh, and uh, an entire flagship hospital with 600 beds uh, that has been put up for quaternary care setup. So Deepak, thank you very much for your time today. I formally welcome you to the conversation. Uh, thanks so much, Kastav, and thanks for the introduction. And thank you to the Voice of Healthcare team also to get me on this program. So looking forward to spend some quality time with you. Uh, the pleasure is all ours, sir. Uh, so let's start with uh, COVID-19. We have done a lot of webinars already around uh, COVID-19 and what uh, COVID-19 has changed uh, in the hospital operation side. Uh, as we are slowly moving past this deadly pandemic, we now need to know how uh, hospitals are fundamentally changing their healthcare operations and restructuring their cost uh, uh, frameworks to ensure that they stay resilient and sustain the momentum of high growth in next three to five years. So the first question to you is, you're managing a pretty large hospital, one of the fairly well-known hospitals in India, Manipal Hospitals in Bangalore. Uh, how have you steered the ship to uh, during this huge pandemic and disruptions mm -hmm. in elective surgeries and uh, you know, obviously fluctuation and in inflows of patients. So how have you managed the operations of such a large hospital and what is ahead in front of you as we are moving past this pandemic? Yeah. So, so that, that's an interesting question, Costa, especially, uh, as I say, that human memory typically is quite short-lived. And, and it's not even a year since, I think it was March 21st, when the Honorable Prime Minister called for this Janta curfew, right? And then there was this period of lockdown, which was, I think, 24th of March. So as healthcare professionals, uh, I would I would say that it's been a roller coaster ride for all of us. And, and, and you know, I remember the 22nd of March when the PM asked everybody to come out and clap for the healthcare providers. And, and you know, there were these emotional videos flowing around how uh, doctor mothers could not come back home for Diwali. There were multiple stories of uh, heroism that I think as us healthcare players have got into displaying. There were also the, the, the downsides where I think uh, the industry was subjected to some media trials for, for COVID billing, as they said. Uh, there were you know, some societies where uh, doctors and nurses were asked to move out because of risk of infection. So I would, I would still say that for us, uh, it has been this you know, model of Kavi Kushi, Kavi Gam, exactly going to this last one, one year almost, which is probably concluding now. But, but uh, I think uh, some three broad learnings that definitely came out was uh, dealing with uncertainty for sure, because we did not know what we were dealing with. I think uh, number two was uh, developing a protocol around that to, to kind of deal with these uncertainties and also be very nimble and on the ground because you know, it was constantly evolving parameters. And for Manipal Hospital, I think uh, the core was around our people first philosophy, Costa, if I had to you know, summarize it in a way that we felt that uh, our employees are most important to us. Uh, we ensure that they kind of, their health was taken care of. Uh, proud to say that uh, we didn't have a single layoff or a single person was asked to leave. Despite a large financial distress that happened in the quarter one, quarter two, we did go through our little pressures and funds. But I think the philosophy from the senior leadership team was very clear that let's stay together, uh, uh, you know, take care of each other. And I think that set the ground to deal with this, uh, you know, pandemic that you were specifically asking. The second part was, of course, you know, the, the human part of uh, healthcare brought out because we started working very closely with the government missionaries. 
the stakeholders from the communities got together so you know there was there was a lot of uh, 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 you know demystifying healthcare if i could use the word just to kind of get closer to the reality on the ground with people and their emotions and and the second part was about building clinical credibility so i think uh, 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 you know the disease began to evolve our doctors began to understand what's working on them uh, from you know tablet protocols to ecmos to prone ventilation i think the clinical credibility is something which uh, kind of made us very distinct from a lot of other hospitals uh, you know especially uh, treating patients and creating a brand loyalist out of that because people who got treated with us uh, when they were most vulnerable if you would imagine for the fear of uh, you know losing their lives and then coming out of a hospital safe i think has created a very new band of uh, uh, loyalist to our brand because they believe that this was a place where they kind of got a in quote a second life to that extent you know so that was the second part uh, which kind of uh, you know became a core focus and and then specifically to your question on cost research yes i mean there have been a restructuring that we have uh, you know built into our system in terms of more efficient consumption handling uh, you know uh, doctors restructuring in terms of uh, help, helping them and us kind of ensure that these costs are better managed uh, infrastructurally also cost a lot of uh, changes in terms of dealing with fibril as a disease right the fibril clinics yeah Uh, res- respiratory ICUs, you know, uh, specialist like ENT, ophthal, dental, again very close proximity to treatment plan. So I think what we realized is uh, we have modified behaviors. The new normal, as we kept using the word, has definitely right. got reinstated in our system now, and and it's yes. much more robust and strong to deal with this. So so I think that's that's broadly what it is. And specifically to your question again, uh, uh, you know, people did delay their healthcare buying behavior. So the complexity of care. Uh, and kind yeah. of went up. So somebody who was uh, dealing with an acute abdomen, not coming to a hospital, uh, got into a few complications because he or she had to stay back at home with the fear of not coming to the hospital. So, so we went through that exercise. But I think the last quarter and the quarter for the pent up demand is beginning to come out into the hospital, and people are visiting it more, uh, 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 you know, bolder to believe that uh, the hospitals are better equipped to handle their emergencies. So, if I could quickly ask you about the role of technology in reimagining healthcare operations for you post COVID nineteen, uh, we briefly chatted before the discussion about the role of artificial intelligence and other progressive technologies for you to deliver healthcare at scale and also uh, approach every patient individually based on their you know individual health history. So, could you talk about uh, a little bit more about the technology appetite Manipal hospitals? have right now post covid 19 do you believe that covid 19 was really an accelerator for high adoption of progressive technologies across all departments within a hospital i think that's that's a great question kasta because i think all of us as uh, healthcare managers uh, have never put on a hat of a data scientist right i mean we are all been running hospitals on a very brick and mortar model and in believing that yeah. uh, that we need to be on the ground but i think the moment we put in this and, and you have a vast experience in this area because of your digital practice that you handle yes. in your current firm uh, you know all of us need to start visualizing the power of data and, and begin to realize that how do you use it on a daily basis so to give you an example uh, i mean in my 23 years as i've been building my career in healthcare uh, initially as i never visualized a, a quality video consultation happening with a patient and his doctor where where they could make meaningful diagnosis Uh, and which is exactly what happened on those april may june where almost 100% of our opds were actually being video consulted you know so the doctor and the patient had a very meaningful transaction the emr was getting built in uh, 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 you know and and that emr began to get get into a, a longitudinal flow and across the period of his stay or his uh, hospitalization with us so i think that was a major uh, a breakthrough in our minds when you know people began to consult a uh, true video consultation and, and also pediatric cases uh, uh, you know we had dermatology issues we had again cardiology follow up so the continuum of care was very yeah. strongly built around this yes yeah, so i think i think that has been a major change uh, which we have been noticing and and rest of them are evolving so you know the artificial yeah. intelligence that we used uh, 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 in terms of uh, having a disease management program a chronic disease management program again uh, are again evolving and i think we are partnering with lot of like minded uh, players in the field uh, yeah. which have their core competence in these areas because we are a healthcare delivery company we are not technically an information technology company but one of our cornerstones for the next uh, years of growth is the digital transformation so so the entire yeah. team is oriented to it and and it's working well for us yes yeah 
Speaking about digital transformation, let me quickly share a findings of a consumer survey we did among mm-hmm. the top CEOs globally, not only in India. And yeah. almost 65 to 75 percent of them mentioned that, yes, digital transformation is their core agenda and they are actively placing strategic bets towards making their infrastructure more digitally savvy. And they're also yeah. making investment towards external collaborations. They are beefing up their own internal IT teams to ensure that they can successfully collaborate with a lot of third party players to ensure that the care continuum is completely digitized and their patients receive care um, uh, in equal standard when the patients are in the hospital and when the patients are moving away from that hospital. And we'll talk about uh, yeah. the aspects of care delivered beyond hospitals. But right now, one key question I wanted to ask around digital transformation is, although 75% mentioned that they are eager to invest towards digital transformation, almost all of them also believe, almost 90% of them believed that it's not an easy task to do and it's a long-term game. Three to five years is the time frame they have in mind before they can completely digitize their entire healthcare ecosystem within the hospital and outside. Sure. And some of the cool challenges they're facing is obviously centered around interoperability. Interoperability is one of the core issue, issues that these large hospitals are facing. And when I talk about interoperability, it doesn't mean always the fact that a hospital is not able to collaborate or exchange information with another hospital outside its network. In many cases, even in India, we found that some large hospital, these are integrated delivery networks, which were not able to exchange information within their own hospital from one department to another department. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if a pharmacy within a large hospital system would like to send some information to the lab or the physician directly through a central uh, uh, EMR portal or a HIS portal, many large, fairly well-known hospitals in India are not able to do that. So speaking about uh, your experience dealing with progressive technologies in Manipal Hospital, have you faced any such challenges of, first of all, establishing seamless interoperability across all the departments? And second, um, um, you know, dealing with external uh, health systems to exchange information or share information? I, I think uh, I think this is a concept of a unique health identifier number, the UHID, has been UHID. there for last 10 to 15 years, I mean, very early part of our careers, there was a concept that one UHID, that UHID, you know, stacks the medical record of the patient and the patient can flow from one hospital to the next and it's seamless. But I, I think that cost of is a change in mindset where every one of us, including say the nursing, the lab technician, the nursing doctors, your paramedical staff, everybody starts contributing in building that digital uh, story, right? And what happens is, this interoperability does fail when when the chain starts getting broken out because there is a paper pen that comes to the table and and right. the paper is scanned the, the data can't be mined forward so so honestly uh, uh, we wouldn't want to claim that we have really mastered this art we are going through the transition and and the senior leadership team again is believing that it must become a way of their daily life you know, for example uh, if i start uh, say interviewing a candidate without getting them on uh, to fill up a paper pen and get everything digitized. You know, so the person has a yeah. form to to fill up his CV, and and you know we start practicing digitization in various aspects of hospital operation, not just the clinical part. I think I think we are going to start uh, you know uh, walking the first journey. So 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 computer on wheels, uh, point of care devices which can kind of uh, capture the uh, vitals of a patient directly from the monitors, and and you know start building that electronic record. Is, is the start point. And, and I think in our context, we have a fairly robust uh, IT system, uh, which has stabilized for the last many years. And, and, and that has helped at least, uh, you know, as they say, the, the health level, set, uh, the staging. So we would definitely be in a stage where our lab diagnostics, uh, the, the, the back systems are all now kind of interoperable. Uh, yes. the, the gap still remains around capturing that core clinical histories at the bedside, right? Because or the OPD desk because the doctor would prefer to have a dialogue and still have a pen and paper written, uh, which is the journey we are trying to now cross. Uh, I I think it has to be where the users see value in why they are doing it. And I don't think it can really be enforced in a a way that they are forced to do with, you know, the single key uh, typing, which kind of takes away the charm of it. So even today we are doing this chat on a online platform and it's as meaningful as it would have been if you were face to face. I think that evolution is more of a change in our behavior as uh, a daily transactional uh, digitization 
which will then go into your uh, operational transactions at the workplace too. So I think that's the way I would look at it. Yeah. We are walking towards it. Uh, it's not easy, but for sure, as we are moving along, we're beginning to realize that it has to weave around the daily life. You know? So it has to be as seamless in terms of applying for my leave on my on my app, which has been developed now. We have a doctor app, which is fairly robust. We have a patient app, which is robust. So I think when people can transact their banking on health uh, on, on an app, I mean, why not healthcare, right? So. So we need to start moving that journey and I think we're making some first steps there for sure. Thank you for that insight. Uh, Deepak, let's uh, now touch upon uh, the other aspect we briefly talked about uh, prior to this question, which is how care is delivered outside hospitals and how hospitals are playing an increasingly important role uh, to make that happen on behalf of patients. And also, I wanted to understand from your standpoint, if you're delivering care outside your hospitals and basically bridging the gap that we are witnessing across India when they leave uh, their uh, health systems and go to their homes or go to another hospital, uh, what role Manipal is playing uh, to ensure that the gap is mitigated? And second, how Manipal is collaborating with other stakeholders, be it in terms of M health companies, digital therapeutics companies, or even payers that are responsible to reimburse um, the hospital expenses on on behalf of their patients. Yeah, yeah. So, Kostav, I, I think I think again one reality check that has come to us is that we are a part of a larger ecosystem, and, and, and there are players across different spectrum of care, whether it's a primary care, the diagnostic teams that are doing diagnostic lab, the pharmaceutical companies, and pharmaceutical retail outlets. Uh, you know. The, the, the kind of uh, care at home through physiotherapies and uh, you know people going to their home, uh, we are beginning to realize that the ecosystem is becoming larger and much more better wired and connected, you know, because that is the transition which we have to realize. Uh, earlier, there were silos, the hospital believed that they can manage on their own. Uh, and also I'm saying it is much smarter now for us to, to kind of decongest our hospitals and, and eventually focus on surgical work, uh, focus on critical care admissions, uh, make hospital as a destination for doing uh, only those kind of works which typically cannot happen at home. You know, so to the extent that there are uh, now models of uh, care at home where even ICU can be created the house. But I'm saying we don't want to go that far. But definitely, uh, if we focus as a tertiary care, quaternary care player, where our focus would be to do uh, uh, high-end uh, 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 surgical work, we take in patients with uh, high comorbidities and acuity of care to do critical care work then a lot of other activities can be decongested from the hospital's portfolio. So I think that's that's one way going forward. And we have definitely uh, evolved very strongly in that segment. Uh, 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 you know, we have a team now which does a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, post video consultations, ensuring the drugs are delivered at home. Uh, we have a team of phlebotomists to go down and kind of collect samples. Uh, we were the first few who actually did even uh, sample collection for COVID-19 from homes. Because the, the inertia of not coming out of the house was almost six months to nine months as you know elderly patients uh pediatric patients they didn't want to come home so come out of their homes right so so they finally had to reach out to us and we developed a system around that payment gateways are interfaced so that you know the, the work is seamless so it has been a, a very very satisfying journey on that front i think uh, 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 you know right from delivery of drugs at home to to samples being collected because we have an advantage of of uh, closing the loop from the doctor's perspective, doctor doing the consult, he advising what tests to be done, the test reports come back into his uh, uh, you know, portal for him to see the values, and then he has a follow-up consultation with a recommendation of medication. So I think as a healthcare player, uh, which is into delivery of healthcare, we have integrated uh, the uh, other uh, streams quite well. Sure. Uh, Deepak, let's talk about uh, various other initiatives uh, you know, other hospitals are taking to ensure that they stay in touch with their patients. We are aware of a few large hospital systems in Northern India that are now delivering medicines on their patients' behalf. And there are multiple implications to that strategy. One strategy is definitely as COVID-19 has put a break uh, in, in international patient inflow, these hospitals are trying to capture the most of the local patients. Uh, right. And the only way of doing it is to offer incremental value-added services to local patients. Second, uh, you know, as you bridge that gap and continue to stay in touch with your patients, you capture data, which is essential for you to train progressive technologies that these hospitals are 
building right now in-house or other they're procuring from from Western markets or even local markets. So from Manipal Hospital standpoint, I'm just trying to understand uh, in terms of rehabilitation services, uh, you know, some of the progressive IT companies are terming this service as cardio rehab or onco rehab services. And the services are delivered completely online through digital enablers uh, and developed in consent with senior positions of a large hospital, along with senior technicians from all over the world. So from Manipal Hospital standpoint, um, just trying to understand, would you be willing uh, to experiment with such rehabilitation technologies that uh, can be offered to a patient population, both within India and outside? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I think uh, you know, you somewhere mentioned that there has to be a clinical ownership and buy-in. I mean, if there are a set of uh, physicians and doctors who believe that a lot of their care pathways and protocols uh, can be managed remotely. Uh, it, it works well for us. I mean, uh, to give an example, uh, we have been doing this where we partnered with the government of Karnataka to do the e-rounds, e you know. So our uh, super specialists who are managing COVID in terms of our permanent the critical care team, uh, uh, the infectious disease specialists, all of them formed a panel for the government. And we used to uh, do these e-rounds to uh, monitor beds uh, in the rest of Karnataka region, in smaller towns and cities where uh, the the access to super specialists was limited. So so it worked well. I mean, there were predefined uh, timings of the round. The parameters were uh, predefined as to what you need to look for. And the advice was definitely given and documented. So I think that's been a great example. We have also adopted a lot of uh, smaller nursing homes, uh, critical care beds. So, so a lot of the ICUs are three to four in structure. They have uh, two to three beds with them. Uh, they have a good team there, but they are teams which can't be round the clock supporting the care. So again, we have uh, taken the EIC as a model where, where uh, through few technology partners, it's worked well for us. So, so as a as a uh, receptiveness for the idea, we have already been doing it. Uh, uh, definitely, the the cornerstone for its success would depend on how the clinicians adopt it. You know, because they are the ones who have to deliver. So, uh, to give yeah. you another spectrum. A uh, few specialty like the spine surgeries or the orthopedics, you know, you really can't make a meaningful diagnosis unless you don't kind of uh, examine and uh, see the range of movements in a little uh, a touch and feel pat pattern, right? So if you do this smartly, uh, look at those specialties uh, which can be done easily through a remote monitoring, especially the rehab example you gave in. I think it's uh, definitely doable, uh, Kostav, and I think uh, we have had a, a track record of uh, successfully implementing some of them as well, yes. Okay. <clears throat> we also briefly touched on international patient populations and their impact in the Indian healthcare business. Yeah. Um, you know, I was interacting with a senior bureaucrat recently, and he was concerned about the fact that although medical tourism was promoted hugely by government of India a few years ago, when we had specific provisions in healthcare budget to promote uh, high attraction in the medical tourism industry, but the reality, especially due to COVID-19, is a little different. We are basically slipping off that list of being the number one destination of quality and affordable care in the global healthcare scene. So just trying to understand, Manipal historically has catered to a lot of international patients, and that continued to happen. Uh, but uh, because you're managing this uh, from, the, from the front end and you're dealing with a lot of international patients, probably you have been interacting with them as well. What has been your experience in uh, understanding their evolving needs, especially in the context of COVID-19 to come to India for quality and affordable care? Yeah. I think that's a great question, Kostav, and, and we've been uh, trying to figure out answers to that. But one one core area which has definitely come out is that that uh, you know we need to pitch, pitch India against some of the competition in terms of the other healthcare destinations. So there are markets like Turkey, uh, South Africa now, for example, with its strain of virus there. So there would be a general uh, uh, hesitant uh, behavior in terms of the international patients to go to some of these regions which traditionally they went. And as a country, we need to start positioning that, look, uh, we are uh, now manufacturing vaccines. We are uh, vaccinating our team and the, uh, and the community. So it's a much safer place to come. And, and uh, it, this could not be done by, by one hospital, but it has to be an industry movement. And like you said, we have also been in touch with a lot of uh, uh, health uh, government missionaries, including the uh, foreign ministries, et cetera, so that, that they also help us uh, communicate the right message uh, out there to know that the India is a safe destination to travel now. And of course, with that premises, uh, you know, you also are uh, trying to look at options where we can send teams 
uh, out there to to do surgeries abroad as a program which we have been successfully doing where a team of doctors and nurses go from here and time because uh, beyond a point you really can't delay uh, your pain in the knees or a, or a liver surgery or 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 you know a, a cardiac procedure because you have to get it operated on time so so maybe an yeah. air bubble uh, special provisions for uh, medical travelers just to come in and out uh, because uh, i think uh, you know honestly uh, it's all a question of uh, knowing that rt pcrs are done uh, patients have been you know identified as negative for covid and then you just operate them and uh, get them back on their feet so i think it does need a little bit of a industry push i think we all need to step up on that direction but we are seeing some trickle coming in now pastor and i think uh, that's a great sign yeah yeah i'm really excited to know that and to continue on that uh, note uh, let's again come back to the initial conversation around the role of information technology in delivering superior care uh, to patients uh, who are undergoing treatment right now and patients will probably come to the hospital system in near term uh, from Frost and Sullivan standpoint, we always strive to stratify the application of technology in healthcare in three ways. First mm -hmm. one, as you correctly mentioned, is the clinical domain where AI is directly used to diagnose um, what would be the underlying conditions and where is the affected area. I'm talking about the role of AI in teleradiology now. Uh, and definitely there are other areas where AI is used extensively in ICUs and other critical healthcare systems. However, the application of AI in the clinical domain in India has not been great uh, because of uh, various issues. But one of the key issues that I faced uh, dealing with a lot of hospital systems in India is the concern senior physicians have uh, regarding the authenticity and the accuracy of these technologies in diagnosing uh, this patient's condition. But there are other areas, as I said, the first one is clinical, When there are areas such as financial and operational domains where technology can be equally used uh, to ensure that the revenues are optimized and you uh, also kind of reduce the inefficiency you see in uh, gaps in the revenue cycles that you manage in your hospital system. And finally, you have the operations where AI can be directly used in supply chain analytics uh, right. and other Aggressive technologies uh, uh, can be equally used to ensure that patients are educated uh, on their conditions and they stay uh, on course with their care plan and medications after the surgery is done. Now, I'm just trying to get your point of view around um, this notion of technology being used across different departments uh, in India. Do you believe, do you agree uh, that yes, in India, technology vendors should look out for more opportunities beyond the clinical domain uh, to get immediate traction across large hospital system? Or do you think, no, we should continue to build technologies for the clinical side of things and uh, not only make it for the Indian audience, but also we make it here and then uh, we outsource it to the Western market the way we did it in the ICT technology domain? Right, right. No, I would, I would, uh, in my, in my opinion, think that we must focus in terms of a technology working around the clinical domain first, and, and it must come across more as an augmented care rather than a replacement of care. So, you know, I'm saying, like you said, uh, if a teleradiology report has a machine learning capability to read thousands of CD scans and then realize whether a scan needs an intervention. Uh, those kind of cues is when it's augmenting the clinical judgment and also trying to make life easier for a doctor. So, so you know, with my uh, you know 23 years of in the industry, I realized that what can we do to make the life easy for that uh, core of the hospital, which is your doctor, is what starts uh, technology adoption much better. You know, so so uh, histopath reports getting uh, you know read through a machine learning option, uh, you know at least flag off the normals if that's a start uh, of things that. If there are normal reports, uh, you don't really need to spend time on reading them and flag out the abnormalities which need human intervention or, or the, the clinical uh, brain, as we call it, is when I think technology adoption would be better. And second uh, would be the whole story around the patient's life. You know, the patient life cycle uh, in terms of, uh, you know, reminding them of the medicines to take, uh, reminding them of the doctor visits, getting a trend on their blood parameters. We have done this very strongly in our on our Manipal patient app and we keep encouraging our teams to keep downloading this, but but at the end of the day, you you have the doctor component and you have the patient component, uh, which is married through the technology in the right way. The third component would be what you brought out, you know, in terms of running the hospitals better, 
are cost efficiencies, which are derivatives in my view, because if you do the first two correctly, the third would obviously flow out. You know, so I think yeah. if we go forward in that mindset, you know, and and take small steps, maybe you know, ensure that uh, people find the joy of uh, doing this right, because uh, yeah. like I said, a lot of times it is enforced. The nurse is forced to make those entries. The doctor is yeah. supposed to make those entries, and then it just kills the joy. You know, so if, if you tell the doctor, look. Uh, I can give you uh, this patient's diabetic HP1AC for last six months uh, on a graph to you. Would that help you? You'll say, yes, it does. Can you help me, you know, uh, record this when you are talking to the patient? And can you use this app which does that? I think those are conversations which are better for us. And honestly, with the kind of pedigree of doctors we have in the system, uh, they are looking forward to it as long as, you know, it doesn't uh, kill the joy of uh, a consultation in its true sense. And because that's where the heart of the hospital lies, right? Right. And speaking yeah. about physician burden, I think we need another half an hour to talk about the burden of clinical documentation on physicians. I did a lot of reports around that fact and what's going on in the Western market in terms of clinical documentation improvement technology and how those technologies are automating the process yeah. of clinical documentation at scale. Well, we'll keep that point point. Yeah, so we'll do another call on that aspect alone. Uh, but then we're going over time and I would like to thank you Deepak for your time today. It was a great learning That's experience good. for me and for everyone who is watching the video today. And I hope, um, you know, smaller hospitals, tier two, tier three hospitals also get a lot of inspiration from you as they uh, start to manage their hospital operations during this pandemic and after it. So with that note, thank you so much everyone for joining and hopefully we'll thank connect again. again soon. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Pastor. Thanks.